right, take your Bible this evening, if you would please, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse number 26. Ephesians 4, verse 26. The Bible says, Be ye angry. Boy, you like that, don't you? But he didn't stop there, did he? And sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And uh, Lord, as we open your word to study it together tonight, I pray, God, that you will open our understanding as well as we... Uh, trust to rightly divide the word of truth. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would teach us your word, uh, help us to understand the truth as you've given it. And I pray, Lord, you give each one of us the help we need tonight to understand this uh, concept of anger and, Lord, how we can have victory over anger in our lives. So direct us and guide us now and help us. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, we have to ask the question, is it okay to be angry? Does, does anger and Christianity go together? And, you know, someone said you put the letter D in front of anger and you have danger. <laughs> and we've experienced that. You know, we, we use terms to describe anger like, I think I'm ready to explode we talk about I'm boiling mad I'm boiling mad or I just need to get something off my chest all these things these cliches we come up with just as an excuse to be angry and to be upset about something Ben Franklin said whatever is begun in anger ends in shame he also said, anger is never without reason, but seldom a good one. And it is he who is in the wrong who first gets angry. Boy, we don't like that one, do we? And, uh, and all the husbands said, oh me. <laughs> now, let me define anger for us. Anger, here's your definition, anger is a violent passion of the mind Excited by a real or supposed injury. A violent passion of the mind excited by a real or supposed injury. Now, number one on your paper tonight is this. Is it wrong to be angry? And the answer is no. But it is a qualified no. And I'll help you understand that. There's two words in the New Testament used for anger. One means passion or energy. The other word for anger means agitated or boiling. Now you can pretty well tell by the two words that are used which one would be okay to have and which one would not be okay to have. Biblical anger is God-given energy to help solve problems. God-given energy to help solve problems. Do you recall the Old Testament story when David had taken Bathsheba? And, of course, she was the wife of Uriah. And then he had Uriah come back home and tried to cover it up. But Uriah wouldn't have anything to do with that and you know, wouldn't go home to his wife, and so he ended up sending a, a note to have him killed in the battle, and Uriah carried that note back. 
And remember when God told Nathan the prophet to go and confront David? But he didn't just confront him, he told David a story. You remember what he told him? About the man who had a company come and this man had all kinds of sheep and cattle and things he could serve and uh, this, this guest who comes to his house. But the man didn't take any of his flock. He went down the road to a fellow who had one lamb and he took his only lamb and brought, killed it and served it to his guest. And the Bible says David was angry. Boy, he was, tell me who that guy is. Man, that guy, he's wrong. I'll take care of that guy. Remember what Nathan said? Thou art the man. Thou art the man. And then David realized his sin before God. That, that passion that he had and that energy that he had to right a wrong to, to go against something that he knew was wrong in God's sight. That's the proper kind of anger. It's the anger that Jesus showed when he overturned the table of the money changers. That was passion. That was energy for someone who was doing wrong in the house of God. In fact, turn over to uh, John chapter 2. The Gospel of John. Chapter 2. Notice in verse 13, The Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changer's money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So he, they understood this was passion. This was energy that Jesus gave. And you, what was it against? It was against them turning his father's house into a house of merchandise. Jesus had said, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. It's not known for the buying and selling and the merchandising of animals. And he, he drove them out. That's, that's passion, that's energy to solve a problem. That's the, the right kind of anger. Numerous times in the Old Testament, you'll find God was angry. But God was always angry at wickedness. God was always angry at idolatry, at evil, at unrighteousness. God was always angry at those things. Okay? So, that's the qualified that is it a sin to be angry. Obviously not, because Jesus was angry. And God's been angry. So, obviously, there's, there's a qualified no to that. But we have to ask ourselves th this question. Why am I angry? Anybody who has a problem with anger, you have to ask yourself, why am I angry? Why do I get so mad my blood boils? There's, there's only four sources for anger. All right? Number one is people. You just get angry because people are dumb. Are these stupid people? You know, don't they know how to drive? Don't they know how to do this? Don't they know how to do that? You know, and you just get angry and frustrated with people. I mean, how, how dumb can management be? Huh? I mean, people get those discussions and they get all angry over, you know, they, they get angry at the management and the management wonders how dumb can the workers be? You know, it, it goes back both ways, I'm sure. And so, people. Number two the second reason people get angry is circumstances. Wish I had a, this, this old clunker, I got to drive. I got to go to this dumb job. Or, how come my parents had to die? How come I had to be brought up in this house? How come my parents got divorced? How come I have to live in this dump? It's, you see, and we, we get angry at our circumstances that we find ourselves in. 
third source of our anger is ourselves. You know you can get angry at yourself? Why can't I get a better job? Why can't I lose weight? Why, why do I look the way I do? Why can't I sing? Why can't I teach? Why can't I be more thoughtful? Why didn't I think of this? Why didn't I do this? And some people spend their life always being angry or frustrated at themselves and never, uh, never at peace with themselves. So we have people, circumstances, yourself. There's one more source of anger. Anybody want to guess what it is? Huh? God. God. People get angry at God. And, and the one who will help you get angry at God is Satan. If God loved you, he wouldn't let you live this way. If God loved you, how come he didn't provide for you to get that car fixed? Or he didn't provide for you to get this done? Or he didn't take care of you when you needed this? And boy, he'll hop on your shoulder and tell you all kinds of things to build a case and accuse God to you. I mean, if God loves me, how come my health is so bad? God loves me, how come I'm still single? How come everybody else gets a mate and I don't have one? See? How come I'm alone? You see, you, you, you get angry at God. You get, you get upset. You get passion in your mind against God over a, over a supposed hurt or injury that God's not been right to you. Those are the four sources that people get angry. Now, Anger is an outward sign of being focused on yourself and not trusting God's control in your life. Anger is just the outward sign of you being focused on self and not trusting God's control in your life. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that all things work together together for good, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now you have to ask yourself, is that verse true or not? Don't, and we can, we can amen and we say, yeah, that's true, but then we have to live like it's true. And realize that, not, that, that, that means God is in control of my life. And, and when I'm when I get angry, I'm not focusing on that verse that God's working all things together for good. My job is to love God and to be called according to His purpose. That's all I have to focus on. Love God and make sure... And by the way, His purpose is in the next verse that we're conformed to the image of His Son. So I want to love God and I want Him to conform to the image of His Son so whatever He wants to do to make that happen, I'm okay. Why am I angry? Is Romans 8, 28 true or not? See? If it is, why am I angry? Because I'm focusing on myself and not on trusting God's control of my life. Anger is a detriment to biblical love. Anger is a detriment to successful relationships. Anger is a detriment to you maturing in your Christian life. It'll, it'll stunt your growth like nothing else. Now, if I'm going to deal with anger, if you're going to deal with anger, it's going to require 100% obedience to God in every circumstance and with every person. Did you hear that? If you're going to deal with your anger, it's going to require 100% obedience to God in every circumstance and with every person even when your feelings are screaming otherwise. You don't go by your feelings. Well, that's why we get angry. Number three, how do I know if I'm angry? What are some signs? Are there any signs that I have an issue with anger? Well, grumpy, cutting remarks, sulking, 
You get a critical attitude. You use harsh words. You gossip. You're envious. You like to cause strife or you like to argue. Hatefulness, bitterness, impatience. Most of you know when you read Galatians chapter 5 and you read about the works of the flesh, what's listed in the works of the flesh? Anger. Anger comes from the old nature, the flesh. Look at a, look with me back at James chapter 4. The James chapter 4, right after Hebrews is James. James chapter 4. Notice what he said in verse 1. He said, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Wars and fightings among you. Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Where, where, where's that war and that lust, that, that, that fighting, that anger? Where's that coming from? It's coming from your members. It's coming from you. That's the old nature. That's, that's in every one of us. Don't sit here and say, well, I have a problem with anger. Guess what? Every single person here could have a problem with anger if they wanted to because it's in all of our flesh. It's, it, all of us have the same sinful nature. Don't, don't say, well, you know, we're Irish. <laughs> well, I'm a redhead, you know. Huh? Whatever excuses we use to... Uh, to say it's okay to be angry. It's okay for me to be violent and have fightings and wars in my members. No, it's a work of the flesh. So you're not angry. Listen, you're not angry because the other person's an idiot. You're not angry because that other person's stupid. All the kids are downstairs. <laughs> you're not angry because your hormones are raging. You're not angry because you have a demon of anger. You're not angry because you have an anger gene. All these excuses that people have. You're not, you're not angry because, well, my dad had a temper. Well, it's because your dad was a sinner and had a sin for nature just like everybody else does. Same with your mom. You're not angry because your core needs are not being met. You're not angry because I got out of the wrong side of the bed this morning. No, you know what? Listen, you're angry because you're not getting what you want. Did you hear me? You're, not, you're angry because you're not getting what you want. Why the, you know, why the folks throwing tantrums and walking in the street and busting windows? Why? Because not getting, they didn't get what they wanted. So they're angry. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Would you go there please? Colossians chapter 3. Are you okay? Still glad you came to church tonight, are you? You better not be angry about it. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. Notice verse number 5. The Bible says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, and for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked. That's past tense, is it not? You walked some time when ye lived in them. That's talking about when before you were in Christ. Now verse 8, But now ye also put off all these. What's the first one? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you've put off the old man, that's the old nature, with his deeds. And you put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, 
But Christ is all and in all. And then it tells you what to put on, does it not? Put on is the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Sounds like the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you're also called in one body, and be ye thankful. So we find out, what are you supposed to do? You put off anger. You put it off. You, you mortify it. I, I'll say more about that in just a minute. But let's move into number four. How do I get victory over anger? How do I get victory over anger? Several things you do. Number one, you pray. Have you ever asked God to help you handle things the Bible way? You have not because you ask not. So have you asked God to help you? Don't just say, God, help me not be angry. No, God, help me to handle things under the control of the Spirit and not under the control of my flesh. Help me to respond in the Spirit, not react in the flesh. Ask God for help number two what we just read in Colossians and also in Ephesians you put off and you put on one of the one of the biggest misnomers in the world is something called anger management you don't manage anger you put it off according to the Bible that's like that, that list that we read earlier in Colossians uh, chapter 3. Think about this. There's, there's wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. There's lying. There's, there's uh, uncleanness. There's fornication. There's covetousness. You don't, you don't hear anybody saying, you know, I'm having, I'm having fornication management classes <laughs> or lying management classes. Or, uh, you know, you, we, don't, we don't even think of that. But see, we've kind of taken anger and categorized it as, well, everybody has anger. You just have to keep it under control. No, you have to put it off. You put it off. You kill it. You die to it. You, you mortify it just like you do any other member of the flesh. The problem is you don't see it like God sees it. It's much like worry. Worry is a sin. Well, I'm just a worrier. Yeah, can you imagine if somebody said, well, hey, I'm just a liar. It's what I do. <laughs> or, hey, I'm just a fornicator. It's what I do. You wouldn't put up with that. You wouldn't say no. That's, that's, not, that's not the way it works. But there's certain sins we've come to allow and accept and we've stopped seeing the way God sees them. That's why, number one, the, the first principle in Reformers Unanimous is, if God's against it, so am I. In other words, I've got to see it like God sees it. Because we tend to rationalize away our behavior that it's not that bad. It's really okay. And, and, and God has to say, no, you've got to see it like I see it. If we can, how many of you know when the Bible says if we confess our sin... He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. How many understand that word confess means to agree with God about our sin? You know what it means? I have to see it the way God sees it. If I don't see my sin the way God sees it, then I won't quit my sinning. And most of the reason people don't quit their anger is they never come to see it the way God sees it. Let me ask you a question. What, what kept Moses from going to the promised land? Anger. Speak to the rock, and he got frustrated and angry, the people, and he hit the rock. Anger kept him. The promised land is not heaven. Anger won't keep you out of heaven. The promised land was a victorious Christian life. 
You'll never see a victorious Christian life if you don't settle anger. Put it off. Put it off and then replace it. God always operates on the replacement. That's why he always, you never read in the Bible about put off unless it's followed by a put on. God never tells you to take it off without putting something on in his place. And he gives you those options to put on, uh, put on something in its place. You go back to what angered you. You go back to where you feel like you were injured or you were offended or whatever, and you confess it to God and ask God to forgive you. You get to where, you, you have to get to where Joseph was. And he can look at those, look at those brothers and say, yeah, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You know what Joseph had to do? In fact, look at that verse in Genesis, will you? Genesis 50, verse 20. Genesis 50, 20 is oftentimes called the Romans 8, 28 of the Old Testament. Now, what is happening here, of course, is dad has died. And so now the brothers, Jacob's gone, so the brothers are all concerned that now Joseph's going to let him have it. Now he's going to take out vengeance. So they get together, and again, the brothers haven't learned much. They, they scheme together again to tell him a lie. You know, Dad told us before he died that you should just forgive us and that, you know, you shouldn't be too hard on us, and they're they just lying. And, and Joseph said, you don't have to even say that, guys. He said in verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, how could Joseph get to be able to say that? You know how? Because of verse 19. Verse 19, Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? You know how you can say you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good? Because you know that God is in control. The brothers didn't understand that yet. So what were they still trying to do? Manipulate it. Hey, this is what he said. You lie, you scheme, you manipulate to try to get it to work out the way you want it to. Instead of saying, I'm not in the place of God. The steps of my life are not ordered by me. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy path. What's our job? Acknowledge him. What does he do? Directs our path. Well, I don't like that path. I don't want to go that way. Well, it's all about you, isn't it? See? You're angry because you don't think God's doing as good a job as what you would do. Who are you? Who's the creature to say to his creator? You don't know what you're doing. Hmm? It really is, is a big matter of pride. Joseph said, I'm not in the place of God. I know what you meant, but God's in control. And he meant it for good. And God's able to work all things together for good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Pray, put off and put on. C, to have victory over anger is deal with anger immediately. Deal with anger immediately. Ephesians 4, where we started out tonight, verse 26, says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In fact, it says, if you let the sun go down upon your wrath, what's verse 27 say, church? Neither give place to the devil. When you let the sun go down, what, what's it mean? You're carrying your anger over to another day. Sun goes down, sun comes up, you're still angry. Hmm? You know what you're doing? You're giving place, and literally it means to give ground to the devil. You're giving the devil a foothold in your life when you don't deal with anger immediately. Deal with it right away. Somebody says, well, it's okay. I, I get angry and I just blow up and then it's over and then I'm okay. 
Billy Sunday used to say, yeah, well, a shotgun blast is the same way. Blows up and it's over, but you sure got a mess to deal with afterwards. And that's the way it is with anger. You can think it's over, but you can't, uh, you got a lot of damage done to you that you caused when you blew up. Deal with, it among, uh, deal with it immediately. You give place to the devil, it'll lead to bitterness, it'll lead to malice, it'll lead to depression, it'll lead to death if you don't deal with your anger. The next thing you do to get victory over your anger is you renew your mind. The verse we read over in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, it was where it said, after you put off and you put on, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It talks about, in verse 15, letting the peace of God rule in your heart to the which you're also called in one body. That, that letting the peace of God rule let, let the peace of God make the call. Peace, peace, peace is calmness in your spirit, soul, and body. You're calm in your spirit, your soul, and your body. You have peace. Allow God to give you peace. Again, the more you're in the Word of God, the more you'll understand God is in control. This, you know, when you, when you start having trouble with your eyesight, you'll go to the eye doctor. And the first thing they do, they sit you down, and they may have you cover an eye, and they have something that's on the wall, and they say, read that chart. And they'll tell you what line they want you to read. And you're, you're trying to read that, and, you know, and you're reading that chart. And, and then, then they put that thing down, and they flip those lenses around you know which is better a or b this one that one you know that's always hard to tell sometimes you know and uh so you start so you start guessing you know but anyway that's another story but you what they're doing is they're they're, they're you're getting your eyesight they're zero in and getting your eyesight corrected so you so you see things clearly you know what happens when you start to get angry you're not seeing things clearly from god's perspective you know how you get your eyesight cleared up? You spend time in God's Word. You get back into His Word. And you, you read it and you study it and you, you meditate on it. And you know what happens? God begins to correct your vision. He begins to correct your eyesight and you see things from His perspective. His ways are not just different than our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. It's a whole different perspective. Looking at it from his perspective, not from our perspective. And so, renew your mind. Yield yourself to God. We're, you're his anyway. Why not yield yourself to him? And let him do what he wants with your life. If, if you do that, there's no need to be angry. None. And the last one, E, is simply this. Remember that God is in control. Remember that God is in control. You know, and you can read these passages later. We won't take time to turn there, but it's great stories. In 1 Samuel 25 is the story of Abigail and Nabal, her husband. And David's men had been in his area. Uh, been his, some of Nabal's men were around David's men, and David's men took care of them. Uh, in fact, they, uh, then, then David had occasion for his men to be in Nabal's territory, and he sent messengers to him saying, hey, my men were very good to your men, took care of your men, protected your men. I'm asking you to do the same for my guys when they're up in your area. And Nabal said, who's David? Oh, I've listened to him. He's, you know, everybody runs away from their master these days, you know, and he ran away from Saul. I don't have to listen to David. And he wasn't very kind to the men at all. Well, word came back to David, and David said, fellas, get geared up. We're going after somebody. And David was going to go, he was going to take care of Nabal. He was going to wipe him right off the earth. <laughs> Abigail heard about it, and, of course, she came to meet him with all kinds of food and goodies and 
she entreats him for her husband. And David, David's anger was abated. And he didn't go after him. But let me ask you a question. Did God take care of it? Yeah, he did. <laughs> Nabal ended up getting drunk and he, he died. The Bible said his heart became like a stone. And God took care of it. You know, if you just will let God take care of it, God will take care of it, and he will do it so much better than you ever could. Just let him take care of it. You remember when David was leaving town, leaving Jerusalem, when Absalom took over in the rebellion? And as he was leaving the, the palace with his mighty men, Shimei was picking up rocks and throwing them at King David. Did you know that? And remember, a couple of his mighty guys said, uh, uh, um, Abishai and uh, one of the other mighty men, they said, hey, let us go over there and take his head off. And, and they would have. And David said, no. It may be that God told him to do that. Wow. I don't know about you. That, listen, that's somebody who realizes God is in control. David's learned some lessons in his life. And he's learned that God's in control. He said, no, just, just let that go. Let God take care of that. You're going to find out that he let that go. And then when he came back to the throne, now he's back on the throne, he's king again, and Shimei is scared to death. He comes in and throws himself on the ground before David and says, oh, I'm so sorry, I should have never done that. Please forgive me. And, and David said, you're fine. I'm not going to retaliate against you. But here's what you got to do. You can't ever leave this boundary. And he put up boundaries for him. He said, you can't ever go outside these boundaries. The day you go outside these boundaries is the day you die. Well, that seemed easy enough for Shimei. He wasn't a big traveler anyway, you know. He kept to himself, and he thought that's a good deal until one of his animals got lost. And it went beyond the boundary, and he went out to get it. And then word came that Shimei had gone outside the boundary. And, and again, God took care of it. David didn't have to. God took care of that. You see, uh, and by the way, it was worse for Shimei that God took care of it than David take care of it. Let me illustrate this with a, with a story I read this week. Bruce Goodrich was being initiated into the cadet corps at Texas A&M University. One night, Bruce was forced to run until he dropped. But he never got up. He died before he ever got to enter college. A short time after the tragedy, his father wrote a letter to the administration and faculty and the Corps of Cadets. Here's what his dad wrote. I would like to take this opportunity to express the appreciation of my family for the great outpouring of concern and sympathy from the Texas A&M University community over the loss of our son Bruce. We were deeply touched by the tribute paid to him by the battalion. We were particularly pleased that his Christian witness did not go unnoticed during his brief time on campus. Then he went on to write this. I hope that it will be of some comfort for you to know that we harbor no ill will in the matter. We know our God makes no mistakes. Bruce had an appointment with his Lord and is now secure in his heavenly home. And when the question is asked, why did this happen? Perhaps one answer will be so that many will consider where they'll spend eternity. My friend, you know what that is? That's somebody who realizes God is in control. That's not somebody who says, huh, my lawyer will be calling you. I'm going to sue you for what you did. God, how could you let my boy, he's only 18 years old. If somebody says, God makes no mistake. And I know we can all sit here and say, well, man, I don't know if I could do that. Well, you don't, we don't know until we're in that situation and God gives us the grace we need to face that situation. 
But certainly that's, that's a powerful illustration. That's exactly what we're talking about. You talk about someone who realizes God's in control of my life, not me. That's no different than Job losing everybody and everything and saying the Lord has gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See? Anger. Anger. Why don't you confess it to God and ask Him to help you to see it as He sees it and realize that He's in control of your life. Yield yourself to him. Let him direct your path. Let him direct your steps, not you. You'll be much happier when you will. And, and that, that goes in every area of your life, every aspect of your life. You realize that anger is a work of the flesh. Most of us, most of us don't have the anger we ought to probably for against wickedness and unrighteousness and idolatry and those kind of things. We're much more prone to have the negative kind that just affects us because we didn't get what we wanted. So let's ask God to help us, all right? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth this evening. I pray, Lord, you would give each of us the help we need on this important issue of anger. Lord, we realize anger is really a lack of trust and faith in you that you are in control of our lives. It's really a lot of pride thinking that we know better than you do. And Father, we are asking you to help us tonight to see things from your perspective, to see things from your viewpoint. And Lord, we know when we get to heaven to be with you, and we look back over our lives, we'll have to look at you and say, you do all things well. You do all things well. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I, just before I finish the prayer tonight, I wonder how many folks tonight would say, Pastor, God dealt with my heart tonight about this issue of anger. I'm asking him to help me. I'm going to follow these steps about overcoming anger tonight, Pastor. But the Spirit of God has spoken to my heart. And I appreciate you praying with me about it. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me tonight. Will you? Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. Father, we thank you now for speaking to our hearts tonight. And Lord, I pray that we'd leave this place and be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Lord, I know that I just know how Satan operates. And I'm, I know he's going to He's going to try to snatch this right out of the hearts of people who've made decisions this evening. And Lord, I pray they'd recognize who's behind the attack and they'd recognize that what the situation is. And no matter what comes about in our lives, Lord, may we realize that our job is to, in all our ways, acknowledge you. You'll direct our paths. Remind us over and over of Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We love you. We thank you, Lord, that you so love us, that you're so involved in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you'd make us mindful of your presence now as we leave this place tonight. Help us to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing our song together. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Got it? The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up.